You know, we won three Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects. I can remember one time I was in the kitchen cooking and I got a phone call and it was one of my friends from work and he said, he said, we won. I said, what did we win? He said, aren't you watching TV? I said, no, I'm not watching TV. Why? What's on? He said, it's the Academy Awards. We won the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. What is the last film you watched at home? Shawnee and the Knee. How do you like Jackson E. E. Yang Qianxi's performance? performances were amazing. Hi, John. Hi. Nice to meet you. I love your background. Crazy alien posters, yeah. Yeah, it's hilarious. We did the alien in that in that movie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you are considered a true pioneer in the CGI field. So when you started doing a lot of this, a lot of things didn't even exist. I can't even imagine like inventing things every day and when nobody else had done what you did. So back then, how did you feel about this innovation and what was your inspiration? It's true, we didn't really have computer graphics back when I started. I was hired by Ray Feeney to build a motion control camera system. So uh, what we okay. did was we did model photography and we did graphics photography. So I was hired to help build those computerized camera systems. So we weren't really using computer graphics at all to begin with. And then Ray Feeney had the idea we were about to start working on uh, the first uh, Star Trek movie, that we could actually preview these on the computer. And we used that first computer graphics computer just to pre-visualize what we were going to do with our model photography and with our graphics photography. We wrote our own software for this pre-visualization and then Bill Kovacs realized these images look really good. We can actually mm -hmm. use these images as images. We don't need to just use it for previewing. And so that's, that's when we first started actually using computer graphics. So throughout all these years, you have been working in this field for such a long time. And what has been that drive that keeps you going, that makes you discover even better quality of CGI? For me, it's not about the visual effects. For me, it's about mm -hmm. the people. You know, I'm in this business because these are artists. I get to work with artists. With some of my friends started a new company that we called Rhythm and Hues. <laughs> Our goal when we started that company was to do world-class imagery, to do the best quality images in the world in an environment that we enjoyed working in. We wanted to be happy with the people, so we hired people that we like to work with. So that's always been my driving force. You know, we won three Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects. I can remember one time I was in the kitchen cooking and I got a phone call and it was one of my friends from work and he said, he said, we won. And I said, what did we win? He said, aren't you watching TV? I said, no, I'm not watching TV. Why, what's on? He said, it's the Academy Awards. We won the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. You know, for most of my career, I was an actual artist on the computer creating imagery but also part of my job was to try and remove roadblocks. You know, I saw my job as trying to make it such that the artists can do what they need to do, you know, to remove mm -hmm. anything that's getting in their way. Thank you, John. People say that only people with a bigger heart and bigger image can get those tiny details done really well. I think you're one of them. It's all, it is all about details. We all know that there is a very famous director who's famous for rejecting to use CGI almost, and his name is Christopher Nolan. <laughs> we all know that he blew up a real hospital for The Dark Knight, and this time his movie Tenen got nominated this year for uh, Best Visual Effects. He blew up a real plan again. And some people think this might be a unnecessary obsession. Do you agree? No, I don't agree. You know, if I have the choice of doing something real on set, uh -huh. in camera, versus doing it in CGI, I would always recommend doing it 
in camera if possible. It's going to look real. Whereas CG, we have to work really, really hard and take a long time to make things look real. The airplane, I, I think it was a great idea. It probably cost less than trying to do it in computer graphics. But there are some <laughs> things where that's much harder to do. I mean, you can buy an airplane and you can build a set and you can do the crash, but uh, for instance, the first Academy Award that we won for Best Visual Effects was Babe. And Babe was a pig, uh, a talking pig. It's just unrealistic to get a pig to talk in camera. Right. <laughs> There's no way we can do that in camera. So, you know, kind of our specialty is kind of animals and characters and, and these things, you're just not going to be able to do them in camera. I am looking on my screen right now. I think on the left side is CG and on the right side is practical special effects. But they both look so real to me. Do you think there's any difference when you're looking at these two different outcomes? Not the images that we're looking at. That's the talent of the artists. And not all mm -hmm. artists have the same talent. You know, because if you're trying mm -hmm. to create believable visual effects, the tiny details are, are crucial. The film that we just did, the Ying Yang Master, Shi Shen Li, there's a giant hand in the movie that walks. And William yeah. Chan had to stand on top. This is where believability comes in because you could have built a stable platform that would have been safe for him to be on, but he's walking on something that needs to kind of move a little, it needs to rock a little bit. So Nikki designed this rig that had a platform up there that William could stand on and so as it moved, it moved as if the legs were moving and so then when we could do the hand in computer graphics under William Chan, you know, it looked <laughs> very real. Currently we're watching through a projector, the newest projector that's about to come out to the market. Do you think this is doing the justice to your work? Yeah, it looks very good. You know, the important thing is that it can be very large and very sharp. So you need high okay. enough resolution that you can see the details of what you're looking at. You know, sometimes you need to look at the shadows. Uh, sometimes the, the shadow might have some chatter in it. I mean, that's often okay. what we're doing. Is we're looking for problems. We're looking for things that give it away. I believe you know that Netflix led the Oscars with 24 nominations. And this year, Netflix has 37 nominations. And we just heard some shocking news from Warner Brothers that they're releasing all of their 2021 movies on HBO Max and in theater at the same time. Does this trend concern you? Well, no, it doesn't concern me. You know, technology advances and the, the way we view things changes. We can't stop technology from moving forward. I mean, I love going mm -hmm. to a movie in the theater, but I watch a lot of movies at home. I jump rope for an hour every morning, and then I, I do some exercises, lift some weights. So, you know, it's like an hour and a half every day, I watch a movie. So I see more movies now than I used to see. In the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, I'm actually in the animation branch. So this year there were 26 animated movies that we had to judge. So when the movies are available in the theater, I watch them in the theater, but I watch mm -hmm. most of those 26 movies, you know, at home. I definitely prefer the cinema because when the screen fills your entire field of view, it becomes very, very immersive. I can lose myself in the movie much more easily. You know, that's all I see is the screen. I think it would be better if you are watching a film with your family and friends at home, but still on a bigger screen. Well, yes, the bigger screens are better. You know, the home viewing experience is getting better all the time. Larger screens, better color, uh, the HDRI to, to get better blacks. I mean, when you go to the theater, it's a projector. You know, it's an electronic projector. It's a laser projector. So the technology yeah. between what we have at home now and what we have in the theater is very, very similar. They're also making these projectors much easier to use. You know, they have a lot of self-calibrating features, so you don't have to get it physically positioned the way you would normally have to get it physically positioned. So. They, they can adjust themselves quite well. Exactly, I love that feature because you know, it used to take me forever to adjust the screen. And I probably have OCD because I cannot stand when the screen is a little bit off. It's just, it just kills I, me. I, I agree completely. I like it level. <laughs> I want it level. What is the last film you watched at home? Shaun and the Knee. Oh, Shaun and the Knee. How did you like Shaun and the Knee? 
Oh, I like it. I think it's a very, very excellent movie. How do you like Jackson E. Yi Yang Qian Xi's performance? The performances were amazing. You see, I don't speak Chinese. When I'm watching, it's primarily the actors that I'm looking at in the performance. I can, I can figure out what's going on, but I, I don't really understand everything that they're saying. So. But the performances were, were amazing in that film. And since you mentioned Xiao Nian Deni, back in 2002, Zhang Yimou's Hero was nominated as Best Foreign Films. Almost 20 years later, we have Xiao Nian Deni, Better Days, nominated as Best International Feature Film. Do you see there's a chance for these Chinese films to get more and more popular and more and more loved in the international and the U.S. market? It's difficult. The problem mm -hmm. that is almost impossible to overcome is that the American audience will not look at a film that requires them to read the subtitles. Here in China, mm -hmm. in, in Europe, you know, there's no problem in Europe with uh, subtitles and, and dubbing. I think they will be accepted in the European market because people there, there are so many different languages. It's not the story because human life is universal. You know, it's the same whether we're in China or whether we're in the United States, and the same kind of stories are going to appeal to us. I mean, you can just look at a film like Nomadland. I mean, that was, that was a you know, directed by a Chinese person, you know, and that's a fantastic film. You know, it's nominated for Best Picture. She's the, I think, the most awarded director in a film season in history. So it's totally accepted, you know, here's a Chinese director that did a fabulous movie, but because it's a English language film, and so the American audience is accepted. Language is a barrier. It's too bad because there are a lot of really wonderful films being made around the world that people in America don't really see very much of. So are you going to watch The Yin Yang Master at home on, uh, with the new projector? And are you going to jump rope in front of the projector? I have. I've done exactly that. I saw it the first time <laughs> in the theater, and then I saw it again uh -huh. at home, jumping rope. Thank you so much, John, for your time and your great answers. Well, thank you. Nice talking with you. Nice talking with you, too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>